Hello class, we are now starting the cardiovascular system. So this is my first um, video on the cardiovascular system. Hopefully you'll get through it okay. Let's just get started with what the cardiovascular system is. It, in, it includes three major parts. First we have to have a pump. That's the cardio part. That is your heart. The vascular part means vascular means the blood vessels and that those are the tubes and what is being pumped is the blood and that's what's inside the tubes so basically the cardiovascular sy system is just a pump some tubes and then the fluid that's within the tubes so we're going to be starting with the blood so blood is your river of life. What are some of the functions of blood? Well, when you think of blood, you think of it as moving. What is it moving? What is it transporting? It is transporting oxygen, nutrients to tissues, and it's transporting um, metabolic waste, CO2, away from the tissues. And it's also transporting hormones that are released by our endocrine glands into the blood and the, the hormones will be transported to their target organs. Um, another function is protection. What is, how would blood protect us? Well, it's transporting our immune defense cells, your white blood cells, everything that's out there that wants to kill you. Those white blood cells are there to help save you. So it's transporting those vital white blood cells, and it's also tr transporting clotting factors. So if you cut yourself, you won't bleed to death. Um, and regulation, that's something a lot of people don't think about, but um, inside blood we have buffers because we need to keep our blood at a certain pH. We like it around 7, 7.4. That is a good pH for our blood. So there's buffers within our that blood to keep that pH at that level. And we've talked about vasoconstriction and vasodilatation before. So if you are cold, your blood vessels near your skin are going to vasoconstrict. Um, it's going to try to keep you warm by vasoconstricting and sending that blood deep into your pore. If it's hot outside, those blood vessels near your skin are going to vasodilate. They're trying to release that blood, that, that heat deep within you to the outside world. That's why when you vasodilate, you flush. You are actually seeing um, the red blood cells underneath your skin and it gives you that red rosy color. So enough about the functions. What is blood? Number one, you need to remember blood is a connective tissue we talked about the ground substance of connective tissue can be watery a liquid it could be gel like syrupy and it could be firm like our cartilage or hard like our bone this ground substance is obviously a liquid ground substance so remember blood is a connective tissue now you should also be following along with this worksheet. So if you don't have this worksheet, go ahead and stop this video and go to your website and get this worksheet because you can be filling it out while you're going through this video. So what are the two components of blood? We have the liquid portion called plasma and we have another portion called the formed elements and you probably have all seen this example here we have a tube of blood that they've drawn and if you just let it sit it's going to separate into this liquid portion down here and then the red blood cells are going to clot and they're going to go down to this bottom part down here so this liquid part up here the plasma 55% of whole blood is plasma. 92% of plasma is just plain old water, H2O. 
7% proteins, lots of proteins in our plasma. And the, the rest, 1% is going to be a variety of nutrients, electrolytes, hormones, and waste products. And then we get down to the formed elements. Now there are three formed elements, white blood cells and platelets and red blood cells. Together, all these three formed elements make up about 45% of our whole blood. And if you look at this, this is showing you a little tiny sliver of white. This, we call this little sliver the Buffy coat. It's less than 1% and it's containing our white blood cells and our platelets. Most of it, most of these formed elements are going to be red blood cells. So I just wanted to show you um, different tubes. Here's when you say you have a hematocrit of say 40%, they are talking about the percent of red blood cells in your whole blood. So these are giving you the basic normal levels of females and males hematocrit. If you're anemia, if you're anemic, you have a decreased hematocrit. That makes sense. Decreased red blood cells. If you have polycythemia, it means your red blood cell count is too high. Your hematocrit is elevated. And I'll talk about this condition in a little bit. And how do we get these formed elements? Where do they come from? Remember this term, hematopoiesis, also known as hemopoiesis. Heme means blood, poiesis means formation of. This is the formation of our blood formed elements. All three of these are formed, are made where? In the red bone marrow. Red bone marrow, all three formed elements are formed in the red bone marrow. So just to go over this, what are the three formed elements in the blood? What are they? Red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Where are they all made? In the red marrow of the bone. So we're going to start with our first um, formed element, and that is red blood cells. RBCs, red blood cells, aka erythrocytes. Cyte means cells, erythro means red. These are our red blood cells, erythrocytes. But they are not really cells. They do not have internal organelles. They have no nucleus. These cells do not divide. They, their average lifespan, once they're set out into the blood, is about um, released into the blood is about 100 to 120 days. And once they start getting old, you know, around 110, 120 days, these worn out blood cells are going to be taken out of the circulation by two organs, the liver and the spleen. So I just want to have you look at the shape of this red blood cell, and we'll talk about it on the next slide. But this is not, not a nice round cell. It is biconcave. You can see it's concave right here. Oh, not this slide. <laughs> the slide after that, we'll talk about them. But I just wanted to show you, this is a blood vessel. And here are red blood cells within this blood vessel. Remember, all blood vessels are lined with a special type of simple squamous epithelium called endothelium. Remember that? Here's the, the nuclei of this endothelium. It's squashed down. It's just one layer thick. What was the function of endothelium? To create a frictionless environment so these um, blood formed elements can go through here without any friction. Now we'll talk about why we have the shape of our red blood cells. Now, number one, these are the most common formed elements in your in your blood. So if you're looking at a blood smear, here's our blood smear here. Basically what, the, what you're seeing here is red blood cells. We have millions of red blood cells. Since these are not true cells, don't think of them as 
true cells. Basically, they are bags, merely bags, to carry a structure called hemoglobin. You've all heard of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin's an iron-rich protein. Its job is to transport oxygen to your body, your body tissues. So why do we have our red blood cells biconcave and not just round? Well, this shape gives more surface area. In anatomy, we've talked about surface area a lot. Now, why would this be helpful, helpful to have more surface area on these red blood cells? Because the more surface area you have, the more hemoglobin you can carry, the more hemoglobin you can carry, the more oxygen you can carry. So this is the size. You don't have to know what the size is. Just know it's small. But when we start looking at white blood cells, we're going to be comparing the size of a white blood cell to these red blood cells. So normally we have about four to six million red blood cells per cubic mil of blood. So 10 to the six is million. So millions of red blood cells. And I want it to touch bases again with this hormone. We talked about it before, erythropoietin, a.k.a. EPO. Now, erythropoietin is a hormone that is made and released by the kidney. So the kidney is making this hormone in response to decreased tissue oxygenation. What does that mean? It means the tissues are saying, I don't have enough oxygen, guys. So your body responds by saying, oh, okay, the kidney is going to release erythropoietin. What does erythropoietin do? It triggers erythropoiesis. What is erythropoiesis? It's the formation of erythrocytes. So if you are anemic, you have a low um, red blood cell count, your body's going to sense that has low oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. There's not enough red blood cells to carry the hemoglobin to perfuse your tissues. So your kidney releases EPO, EPO um, triggers erythropoiesis. Where's erythropoiesis taking place? In your red bone marrow. Got it? Now, if we say we have a patient that has lung disease and he has decreased tissue oxygenation, now this is EPO is released in response to decreased tissue oxygenation. It doesn't know why you have decreased tissue oxygenation. Is it because you you've got low red blood cells? Um, it doesn't really know why. So people with chronic lung dis disease that have decreased tissue oxygenation, their lungs aren't working. Their EPO levels are going to go what? their EPO levels are going to go up. The kidney will secrete more erythropoietin. The erythropoietin will act on the red bone marrow to make more red blood cells. Now that may sound good, but let's go back to this. If, if you get something like this, if you have polycythemia, your, your body is making a lot of red blood cells, but this is not good. At a certain point, they are going to have to start removing blood from you because too much blood is not good. The blood can get stagnant. It's too much blood, not enough liquid. It doesn't move properly. So once the hematocrit gets around 56%, they are going to start 
start doing bloodletting. They're just going to drain that person um, and remove some of their blood to get their hematocrit down to a normal level. So I just wanted to kind of go through that so you understand what's triggering EPO is decreased tissue oxygenation. So it doesn't really matter uh, what's the cause of it. All of your body is sensing there's decreased tissue oxygenation going on and your body wants more red blood cells to carry more hemoglobin. And remember, red blood cells only live to 100, 120 days. Oh, one other thing I wanted to say. If you have kidney disease or if you are in kidney dialysis, your kidney can no longer make EPO. So people that are on kidney dialysis, usually they have to get a shot of erythropoietin about every three months to keep their red blood cell count up. Hopefully that makes sense. If not, let me know. Our second um, formed element that we're going to talk about are white blood cells. White blood cells, a.k.a. leukocytes, white cells. These are real cells. They have a nucleus. Uh, a nuclei, they have nuclei and they have internal organelles and if they are needed, if they're called into action, they will divide. Remember, white blood cells are your defense mechanism of the body. They are also formed in your red bone marrow. Now, the size of these white blood cells can vary. They, they can be close to the size of a red blood cell to three times the size of the red blood cell. And that's going to be important because it's going to be one of the ways you're going to, when you're looking at them on a blood smear, look at the size relative to the red blood cell. Now, the average number of white blood cells at your body in a normal time when you don't have an infection is about 4 to 10 times 10 to the third. So this is four to 10,000 white blood cells per cubic millimeter, much less than the millions of RBCs that we have. So they, they're just flowing around in your blood. These white blood cells are flowing around in your blood. Now this little picture is kind of good little picture. So the blood's just flowing around and if your body senses that there's an infection somewhere in your body, in some tissue, what's going to happen to these white blood cells, they are going to leave, they have to leave the blood cell to get to the tissue. <clears throat> so they are going to roll and attach to this endothelium and they're going to squeeze out through the endothelium. This is called diapedesis. And they're squeezing through the endothelium and then they're going to go to the tissue where they are needed. Kind of cool. So white blood cells. You have five of them. You need to know all five. You need to know their functions and what they look like. Now we have them listed here in order of relative abundance, meaning neutrophils. This is neutrophils. He is the most common, the most abundant white blood cell in our body, followed by lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. So this is showing you the relative abundance here. And you need to, rem you need to know this order of relative abund abundance. You will see it not only on my exam, but you most likely will see it on any T's exam also. How do you remember? Never let monkeys eat bananas. N, neutrophil. L, lymphocytes. M, monocytes. E, eosinophils. B, for basophils. Never let monkeys eat bananas. So, um, the other thing that you probably be tested on by me and T's is the two main classes of white blood cells. The first class is called the granulocytes. They are telling you, I'm a 
I'm a cell with granules. These have granules in their cytoplasm. Versus the A granulocytes, I'm a cell and I do not have granules in my cytoplasm. So let's look at these, these um, two main categories. Start with the granulocytes. Now the granulocytes, it has three of our five um, blood blood, uh, white blood vessel, white blood cells. All these granulocytes are larger than red blood cells, and they have what they call segmented or lobulated nuclei. Um, let me see if I can try to draw this. I don't know if I can. Beep, boop. There's something came up. There's one lobule. Ooh, there's two lobules. Ooh, well, okay. So this is a three-lobed um, nucleus. So when we look at them, this will make more sense. But these are lobulated nuclei, so they are going to look a little different. Now the three types that, of granulocytes we have are neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. They all end in fill. What does fill mean? You've seen that word, that fill before. You've in Bio 107. Remember the terms hydrophilic? What is hydrophilic? It means it likes water. Lipophilic, it likes lipids. So now we have this guy that likes baso, this guy that likes, he likes eosin, and he likes neutro. What do these mean? Well, let's start down here with basophils. Their granules like basic blue stains. These, these stains, um, they're blue. They're blue. So when you look at a basophil, he's going to have blue granules. Now, eosinophils, they like the stain called eosin. And if you are in micro or have done micro, you will, know, you will be using that stain, and it stains reddish pinkish. So these guys, eosinophils, they like red stains. A neutrophil, he likes both. He likes both the blue stains, he likes the red stains, and so he is going to stain more of a purplish color. Red plus blue will give you purple. So he's neutral. He likes both red and blue. So granulocytes. So let's start with our first granulocyte neutrophils. So remember, neutrophils are the most abundant white blood cell. They are our first responders in any type of infection. They are first, our first responders. They are phagocytes. So when you look at them under the microscope, this little drawing is just showing you a, a neutrophil with one, two, three, four. This has five lobes. Neutrophils have three to five lobes that are interconnected. And they're um, about 1.5 times as large as a red blood cell. So here you look at them here. Here are red blood cells back in the background. These are neutrophils. These are all neutrophils. Lilac granules. One, two, three, maybe four lobes here. This one's I don't know how many lobes are there, I can't count them, but this one's got one, two, three, four, five lobes with lilac granules. These are all neutrophils. As opposed to a eosinophil, these guys like what color? They like eosin, which is reddish pinkish. And they are twice as si twice the size of a red blood cell, and they are bilobed. They have two lobes connected by a thin band. So on a, here's a drawing of them, bilobed, red little granules in the cytoplasm. Here's our blood smear, 
red blood cells in the background, bilobed one, two, with pink, pinkish granules in the cytoplasm. Pretty easy to see. And our last guy is basophil. <clears throat> he likes blue. He is he likes our base dyes that are blue. These guys are rare, rare. So never let monkeys eat bananas. He's your banana. They're also one and a half times the size of red blood cells. Their nucleus is usually S-shaped or U-shaped. But you're never going to see the nucleus because the granules of basophil, basophils are so coarse and dark. Like here you can see it. You cannot see the nucleus. It is hidden um, by all those granules. Here's your red blood cells out in the background. Now, what you do need to know about basophils. Oh, you know what I forgot? I forgot to tell you the function of eosinophils. <laughs> oh my goodness. So an eosinophil, when does he show up? Well, he is your main white blood cell if you ever had a parasitic worm infection, which are pretty darn rare in the United States. But these guys are called into action when um, there's any parasites in, that have invaded you. And if you have a lot of allergies, a lot of al allergens, you know, that are triggering your, triggering your allergies, you go outside, you smell something, you say, oh, I don't know what's blooming, but you start sneezing. Those are the allergens and they are triggering your allergies. These guys respond to them. They're trying to neutralize those allergens. So if you got allergies, you probably going to have a lot of eosinophils too. So parasitic worm infections, um, they respond to allergens that trigger your allergies. Now let's get back to basophils. Sorry about that. Basophils. So we don't really know what they do. There's a lot of books that say, well, we don't really know what they do. They're rare. They're pretty darn rare, but they do know what's in these granules. These granules are going to release histamine. Histamine is a potent vasodilator. It's going to open up the blood vessel. And they release heparin, which is an anticoagulant. That means it's going to stop blood from clotting. So why might that be important if you have some type of infection? Well, if they release this histamine at the site of infection, it's going to be a vasodilator it's going to expand the blood vessel so you can get more blood flow to the infected tissue. Get more blood flow to the infected tissue, you, you can bring in more white blood cells to help with the infection too. And heparin, since there's going to be a lot of blood flow to that area because of the vasodilation, we don't want those red blood cells to clot. So just know that Basophils have granules that release histamine. Histamine is a vasodilator and heparin an anticoagulant. So here's a blood smear and it has all three of our granulocytes here. So start with this guy. We just did this guy. Can't really see his nucleus. He's got big coarse blue granules. What is he? He's a basophil. This guy, I can see one, two, three lobes. Um, and I can see some lilac or purple granules in the cytoplasm. So who is he? He is neutrophil. Then this guy, one, two lobes with pink granules. This is eosinophil. He's an eosinophil, neutrophil, basophil. Now let's go on to our A granulocytes. So A granulocytes, they have no granules in their cytoplasm and they have a single nucleus. Two types. 
lymphocytes and monocytes. So lymphocytes are our second most abundant white blood cell. Remember, never let. He's your let. Never was neutrophils. Let is lymphocytes. Never let monkeys. Monocytes is going to be your third most common. So, but we're on lymphocytes. Lymphocytes, about 30% of all white blood cells are going to be lymphocytes. They are small. Remember, a red blood cell was 7.5 micrometers. This is around 8. So these are going to be our smallest white blood cell. These guys have a huge rounded nucleus with a rim of cytoplasm. When we're talking about a rim, sometimes you cannot see the rim. Here is a lymphocyte. Here is our red blood cells. You can see it's just a little bit bigger than a red blood cell and got a tiny rim of cytoplasm, but a huge nucleus. These guys are important. These guys are the ones that produce antibodies. So if you've heard about antibodies, these are the guys that make them. Now antibodies are formed that are specific to a given antigen. And an antigen, if you don't know, antigens are anything that your body senses is foreign to itself. It does not belong there. So these guys are going, you don't belong in here. And they're going to make an antigen that's going to connect. They're going to make an antibody that is going to connect to that antigen and, and inactivate it. So they are going to make an antigen antibody complex, real important to deactivate um, whatever foreign element is coming into your body. And it is these lymphocytes that give us what we call immunologic memory. Immunology, that is just the study of our immune system. So we're talking about our immune system, our defense system that protects us um, from foreign invaders. And that is how we make vaccines. When you are given a vaccine, you are given antigens. Now these are inactive antigens. They're not going to make you sick, but they're going to trigger antibody production to those antigens. So when you were little, you got a measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. You were given the antigens for measles, mumps, and rubella. Your body formed antibodies, antibodies for those measles, mumps, rubella from these lymphocytes. And these lymphocytes um, will live a long, long, long time. So if you ever get exposed to measles, mumps, rubella again, those lymphocytes will be reactivated, divide, and you will be protected from that disease. So that's just the way vaccines work. They are triggering your body to make antibodies and they're giving you immunologic memory. So if you need them in the future, they go, oh, I remember you you're you're not supposed to be here and they will divide and quickly take out um, that antigen very very cool now since lymphocytes are so important remember all our white blood cells are formed in red bone marrow and we have two types of lymphocytes we have the b cells b cell lymphocytes they fight bacteria. B bacteria, B bacteria, they are released into the blood where they are going around, traveling in our blood and um, just making sure nothing's, no bacteria is coming in. And if they are called into action, they will go where they need to go. And then we have T cells. Now T cells fight viruses and they fight fight tumor cells, tumor cells like cancer cells. 
Now these cells are made in the bone marrow, but they are sent to the thymus gland where they mature. So think of T cells going to the thymus gland to mature. Now this thymus gland, when we are newborns, it is huge. Here, here you can see it. Here's our lungs and the heart, and look at this huge thymus gland. By the time you get to be 40, an adult, the thymus gland is that little tiny dot here. It is shrunk. So obviously it's very important um, in, develop, in developing our immune system you know, in infancy. So let's see. Um, oh, T cells. I don't know if you've heard of T cells before in AIDS. Sometimes you'll say they have AIDS patients have low T cell counts when we're talking about these T cell lymphocytes. HIV is humo, human immunodeficiency virus. It's a virus that can lead to age, AIDS, which is the actual syndrome of the acquired immunity, immunodeficiency syndrome. So just keep in mind the difference between T cells and B cells, what their purpose is, and where you where they mature. These guys are just basically maturing in the thymus gland, the T cells and B cells, um, are going straight from the red marrow into the blood. Hopefully that makes sense. And our last agranulocyte, there's only two agranulocytes, are monocytes. Now monocytes are the largest of our white blood cells. These are huge mothers. Look at that guy. They are two to three size the size of a red blood cell. So what you're going to look at is they are huge. They have a single nucleus. It's usually horseshoe shaped. That's hard to say. C shaped. Some people say bean shaped. I don't really know a bean. No, I guess it's a bean or kidney bean, but these guys are huge. Now monocytes, they're going to leave blood vessels and go into tissues. And once they go into that tissues, we are calling them macrophages. These guys are big phagocytes. Look at that. He's a big phagocyte. Um, do, do, do. Oh, and our last formed element are platelets. Platelets are what we need to initiate clotting. If you can't clot your blood, if you cut yourself, you will bleed to death. If a dentist pulls a tooth and you don't have proper clotting mechanism, you will keep bleeding. So platelets are, are important. Now platelets, platelets themselves, they're not true cells. They are just cleaved off of this huge cell that you don't need to know about, but they're cleaved off and they they're are in our blood and they are teeny weeny little guys. So here they're showing you these little dots in the background, these are platelets. So here's our red blood cells, teeny weeny platelets. And they number in the hundreds of thousands. So I wanted to show you this. This is, if you order a blood count on a patient, this is what you're gonna get back from the lab. A CBC with differential and platelet counts. The differential is doing, um, giving you the different white blood cells and their relative amount that you, you have. So let's look, just look at this. Here it says WBC, your white blood cell count is 5.7 times 10 to the third. So it's 5.7 thousand white blood cells. This is normal. Usually you, once it goes above 11,000, you know you have some kind of infection. But this one's normal. Red blood cell count is 5.27 times 10 to the 6. So it's 5.27 million 
this is normal too. Here's our normal right here. Hemoglobin, how much hemoglobin's in your body? Hemoglobin does what again? It carries oxygen and hematocrit is the percent of red blood cells in your whole blood. So here's 44%. Again, that's normal. You don't need to know these, but here's platelets. Platelets, 268 times 10 to the third, 268,000 platelets, also normal. Now, here they give you your white blood cell differential. Neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinoph eosinophils, and basophils. Never let monkeys eat bananas. They are always going to list them in this order. That's why you need to know their relative abundance. Neutrophils, 47%, 46% lymphs, 6% monos, 1% eos, 0% basos. These are all normal. So I just wanted to show you this, how they set up a CBC with differential. It makes total sense. So let's just kind of review some of these to see if you can pick them out. So what is this guy? What kind of white blood cell is this guy? How many lobes does he have? One, two, three, four. Four lobes. Lilac granules, he is a, say it, he is a neutrophil. Oh, look at this big guy. Who is this big guy? Big C-shaped um, nucleus. Look at him relative to these red blood cells. He is a huge guy. Who is he? He is mono monocyte. Now we got two guys, two white blood cells here. This guy, I can see one, two, three, maybe four lobes, kind of lavender granules back in here. Who is he? Neutrophil. Here is this guy. All I see is a big nucleus with a rim of cytoplasm. He's a little bit bigger than our red blood cells. This is a lymphocyte. Here's another big guy with this C-shaped, or maybe this is what they call a kidney-shaped um, nucleus. Pay no attention to the granules. Looks like granules in the back here, but those are not granules. This is a monocyte. He has no granules in his cytoplasm. But the other thing to look at this slide is what are all these little dots in the background? Those are all platelets. Now look at these guys. This one's real easy to tell. How many lobes? Two. What's the color of the granules in the cytoplasm? Pink. These are all eosinophils. And look at their size relative to the red blood cells. You can see some platelets in the background here also. All these little dots are platelets. So, wow, this, this slide's got a lot. Um, who's, start with this little guy. Our little guy with the big nucleus, a rim of cytoplasm. He is a lymphocyte. This guy, one, two, three, multi-lobed. <laughs> All you have to do is go, oh, these multi-lobed, purplish um, granules in the cytoplasm. He's a neutrophil. This guy is bilobed, pink granules. He is a eosinophil. This big blob up here, this is a monocyte, monocyte. Now, so far you've been looking at them up close like this, but in the classroom, when you're looking at them under a microscope, this is what you see. And this, these slides were taken by students in the classroom. 
These are good examples of some basic white blood cells. First of all, look at all the red blood cells and their relative size. Let's start with this little guy. He's almost the same size as the red blood cell. I can, I can barely see a little rim of cytoplasm right there. Who is this guy? He is a lymphocyte. Then you get this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. They all are multi-lobed. All these are multi-lobed. You can tell they kind of have some purplish lilac um, granules in the background. These are all what? Neutrophils. Then this guy, one, two lobes with pink granules, this is what? He's an eosinophil. Easy to see. You should be able to see all those real easy on this slide. Now this guy, look at his size relative to the red blood cell. Huge, huge, C-shaped nucleus. Big, big guy. He is monocyte. And remember, once he leaves the blood vessels, he becomes what? A macrophage. Why is he called macrophage? Macro because he's huge. <laughs> phage because he's a phagocyte. Now, this one might be a little bit harder to see, but see what you can figure out. How many lobes do you see? I see one, two. The granules are what color? Pinkish. So this is an eosinophil. Look at his size relative to the red blood cells here. This guy, he's hard, it's hard to see. But look at his size relative to the red blood cells, and all I see is a nucleus. That is a lymphocyte. Again, what are these guys? Look at all the red blood cells. I see one, two, three, four lobes. I see one, two, three, maybe four lobes on this guy. Purple cytoplasm, he is again a neutrophil. By now, you know who this big guy is. Monocyte, neutrophil. Oh. What is wrong with this blood smear? Normally, you have very few white blood cells, right, in your blood smear. But this blood smear is filled with white blood cells. What is this? This is leukemia. So leukocytes, white blood cells, this is cancer of the white blood cells, leukemia. So I just wanted to show you that picture. Uh, and we're done. So that's your first part of the cardiovascular system. Make sure you fill out your worksheet and you can identify all these white blood cells, what they look like, what their function is. Um, understand red blood cells are not real blood cells and why they're not real blood cells. How long do they live in our body? Try to understand what erythropoietin does, who makes it, what action does it have, what is hemopoiesis versus erythropoiesis. Make sure you answer those two. Okay, um, that's it for now, and next up is going to be the heart.